Part thirty two of The Color of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Freshness of the Universe. The freshness of the world's original forces is one of the wonders which binds me in perpetual fascination. My own strength is a little thing. I am sometimes sick and sometimes well. Some days I am bounding with enthusiastic life. At other times I am drooping with weariness and ill-feeling. But these things, the great currents of original power which make the world, are fresh and forever renewing themselves. Every morning I rise from my sleep, restored and go out of doors, and there they are. At the foot of my garden is a river which has been running all night long, a swift and never-resting stream. It has been running so every day and every night for centuries and centuries, and thousands of centuries, for all I know, and yet here it runs. People have come and gone, nations have risen and fallen, all sorts of puny strengths have had their day and have perished. But this thing has never weakened, nor modified itself, nor changed, at least not very much. Its life is so long and so strong. And another thing that strikes me is the force and persistency of the winds. How sweet they are, how refreshing to the wearied body. I rise with sluggishness and a sense of disgust with the world, mayhap, and yet here are the winds, fresh as in the beginning, to run me through and cool my face and hands and fill my breast with pure air and make me think the world is good again. I step out of my doorway, and here they are, blowing across the garden, shaking the leaves of the trees, rustling in the grass, fluttering at my coat-sleeves and my hair. And I am no whit the wiser as to what they are. Only I know that they are old, old, and yet as strong and invigorating as they ever were, and will be when my strength is wasted and I am no more. And here is the sun bright golden thing of the sky which i may not even look at directly but which makes my day just the same it is so invigorating so healing so beautiful i know it is a commonplace the thing that must have been here before i could be and yet it is so novel and fresh and new even now i rise and this old sunlight is the newest thing in the world beside the day which it makes all things are old, my little house, which after all has stood only a few years, my possessions, dusty with standing a little while, and fading, myself, who am less young and strong by a day, getting older, and yet here it is, new after a million years, and a billion years, for all I know, pouring this golden flood into my garden, and making it what I wish it to be, new. The wonder of this force is appealing to me. It touches the innermost strangeness of my being. And then there is the earth upon which I stand, strange, chemic dust, here covered with grass, but elsewhere covered with trees and flowers and hard habitations of men, yielding its perennial toll of beauty. We cannot understand the ground, but its newness, the perennial force with which it produces our food and beauty, this is so patent to all. I look at the ground beneath my feet, and lo, the agedness of it does not occur to me, only its freshness. The good ground, the new earth, this thing which is old, old, old as time itself, must always have been, and must always be. Where was it before it was here? What stars did it make, and moons? What ancient lives have trod this earth, this ground beneath my feet, and now make it. And yet how comes it, that I who am so young, find it so new to me and myself old, as compared with its tremendous age? That is the wonder of this original force to me. And in my yard are trees and little things, such as vines and stone walls, which for all their newness and briefness, have so much more enduring power than have I. This tree near my door is fully a hundred years old, and yet it will be young, comparatively speaking, and strong when I am no longer in existence. Its trunk is straight, 
its head is high, and here am I who, looking upon it now as old, will soon be older in spirit, unable to bear the too heavy burden of a short existence, and tottering wearily about when it will be strong and straight, good for another life the length of mine, a strange contrast of forces. That is but one of the wonders of the forces of life, their persistence. Yet it is this morning waking that impresses the marvel of their greatness upon me. It is this new day, this new old river, this new old tree, the new earth, so old and yet so new, which point the frailty of my physical and mental existence, and make me wonder what the riddle of the universe may be. End of Part 32Part thirty three of The Color of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cradle of Tears. There is a cradle within the door of one of the great institutions of New York, before which a constant recurring tragedy is being enacted. It is a plain cradle, quite simply draped in white, but with such a look of cosy comfort about it that one would scarcely suspect it to be a cradle of sorrow. A little white bed, with a neatly turned back coverlet, is made up within it. A long strip of white muslin, tied in a tasteful bow at the top, drapes its rounded sides. About it, but within the precincts of warmth and comfort of which it is a part, spreads a chamber of silence, a quiet, small, plain-furnished room the appearance of which emphasizes the peculiarity of the cradle itself. If the mind were not familiar with the details with which it is so startlingly associated, the question would naturally arise as to what it was doing there, why it should be standing there alone. No one seems to be watching it. It has not the slightest appearance of usefulness. And yet there it stands, day after day, and year after year, a ready prepared cradle, and no infant to live in it. And yet this cradle is the most useful, and in a way, the most inhabited cradle in the world. Day after day, and year after year, it is a recipient of more small wayfaring souls than any other cradle in the world. In it the real children of sorrow are placed, and over it more tears are shed than if it were an open grave. It is a place where annually twelve hundred foundlings are placed, many of them by mothers who are too helpless or too unfortunately environed to be further able to care for their children, and the misery which compels it makes of the little open crib a cradle of tears. The interest of this cradle is that it has been the silent witness of more truly heartbreaking scenes than any other cradle since the world began. For nearly sixty years it has stood where it does today, ready draped, open, while almost as many thousand mothers have stolen shamefacedly in, and after looking hopelessly about, have laid their helpless offspring within its depths. For sixty years, winter and summer, in the bitterest cold and the most stifling heat, it has seen them come, the poor, the rich, the humble, the proud, the beautiful, the homely. And one by one they have laid their children down and brooded over them, wondering if it were possible for human love to make so great a sacrifice and yet not die. And then, when the child has been actually sacrificed, when by the simple act of releasing their hold upon it and turning away, they have allowed it to pass out from their loving tenderness into the world unknown. This silent cradle has seen them smite their hands in anguish and yield to such voiceless tempests of grief as only those know who have loved much and lost all. The circumstances under which this peculiar charity comes to be a part of the life of the great metropolis may not be rehearsed here. The heartlessness of men, the frailty of women, the brutality of all those who sit in judgment, in spite of the fact that they do not wish to be judged themselves, is so old and so commonplace that its repetition is almost wearisome. End of Part 33 
Part thirty four of The Color of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When the sails are furled. The waters of the open sea, as they rush past Sandy Hook, strike upon the northeasterly shore of Staten Island, a low lying beach overshadowed by abruptly terminating cliffs. Northwestward, separated by this channel known as the Narrows, lies Long Island. As the waters flow onward, following the trend of the shoreline of Staten Island, they become less and less exposed to the winds of the sea, and soon, as they pass the northernmost end of the island, they make a sharp bend to the west, passing between it and Liberty Statue, where the tranquil Kilvon Cull separates the island from New Jersey. Long ere they reach this region, the sea winds have spent their force, and the billows, which in clear weather are still visible far out, have sunk to ripples, so diminutive that the water is not even disturbed. And here, in Staten Island, facing the Kill von Kull, still stands in almost rural quiet and beauty, Sailor's Snug Harbor. Long ago, this was truly a harbor, snug and undisturbed, a place where the storm-harried mariner, escaping the moods and dangers of the seven seas, found a still and safe retreat. Today they come here, weary from a long life voyage, to find a quiet home. And truly it is restful in its arrangements. The grounds are kempt and green, the buildings pleasingly solemn, and the view altogether lovely, a mixture of land and sea. In the early days this pleasantly quiet harbor was a long distance from New York proper. Staten Island was but thinly settled, and the Kill von Kull a passageway seldom used. Today craft speed in endless procession, like glorious birds over the great expanse of water. On a clear day the long narrow skyline of New York is visible and when fogs make the way of the pilot uncertain, the harbor resounds with endless monotony of fog-horns, of vessels feeling an indefinite way. Though the surroundings are pastoral, the appearance of the inmates of this retreat, as well as their conversation, is of the sea, salty. Housed though they are for the remainder of their days on land, they are still sailors, vain of their service upon the great waters of the world, and but little tolerant of landlubbers in general. To the passer-by, without the walls, they are visible lounging under the trees, their loose-fitting blue suits fluttering light with every breeze, and their slouch hats pulled rakishly over their eyes, an abandoned characteristic of men whose lives have been spent more or less in direct contact with wind and rain. You may see them in fair weather pacing about the paths of the grounds, or standing in groups under the trees. Upon a long bench, immediately in front of the buildings, others are sitting side by side, smoking and chatting. Many were captains, not a few common sailors. But all are now so aged that they can scarcely totter about, and hair of white is more often seen than that of any other shade. For a period of nearly a year, the spring, summer, and fall, I lived in the immediate vicinity of this retreat, and was always interested by the types of men finally islanded here. They came, so I was told, from nearly all lands, France, Germany, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Iceland, Spain, Austria, Russia, and elsewhere, though the majority chanced to be of English and American extraction. Also, I was told and can well believe they are a restless, if not exactly a troublesome lot, and take their final exile from the sea due to increasing years and in most instances poverty, with no very great equanimity. Yet the surroundings and the provision made for them by the founder of this institution, who, though not a seafaring man himself, acquired his fortune through the sea over a century ago, are charming and ample. But the curse, or at least the burden of age, and the ending of their vigor and activities, rests heavily upon them, I am sure. 
I have watched them about the very saloons of the region, as well as the coffee-houses, the small lunch-counters and the moving-picture theatres, and have noted a kind of preferred solitude and spiritual irritability which spells all too plainly intense dissatisfaction at times with their state. Among the quondam rovers are rovers still, men who pine to be out and away, and who chafe at old age and the few necessary restraints put upon them. They would rather travel, would rather have the money it costs to maintain them annually as a pension, outside, than be in the institution not many, but feel a sort of weariness with days and with each other, and I am quite convinced that they would be happier if pensioned modestly and set free. Yet this is a great institution, and indeed a splendid benefaction, but it insists upon what is the bane and destruction of heart and mind, conformity to routine, a monotonous system which wears as the drifting of water and eats as a worm at the heart. And yet I doubt if a better conducted institution than this could be found, or one more suited to the needs and crotchets of so many men. They have ample liberty, excellent food, clothing and shelter, charming scenery, and all the leisure there is. They are not called upon to do any labor of any kind other than that of looking after their rooms and clothes. The grounds are so ample and the buildings so large that the attention of every one is instantly taken. As you enter at the north, where is the main entrance, there is a monument to Robert Richard Randall, the founder of the institution. This marks his final resting place. The remains of the philanthropist were brought here from St. Mark's Church in New York, where they had lain since 1825. The facts concerning the founding of this institution have always interested me. It seems that the father of Captain Robert Randall, the founder of the harbor, was a Scotchman, who came to America in 1776 and settled in New Orleans. The Spanish governor and intendant of that city, Don Bernardo de Galvez, having declared the port open for the sale of prizes of Yankee privateers, Mr. Randall took an active interest in that great fleet of private armed vessels whose exploits on the seas, and even upon the coast of Great Britain itself, did much to contradict the modest assertion of the British naval register that the winds and the seas are Britain's wide domain, and not a sail but by permission spreads. At his death his son Robert inherited the estate. Accustomed to come north to pass the summer months, Robert made, on one of his trips to New York, the acquaintance of a Mr. Farquhar, a man possessed of means, but broken down by ill health. The mild climate of Louisiana agreed with the invalid, and a proposition to exchange estates was considered. After a bonus of five hundred guineas had been sent to Farquhar, this was effected. Mr. Randall then became a suburban resident of what was then the little city of New York. His property consisted of real estate fronting both sides of Broadway and adjacent streets, and extending from 8th to 10th streets. At a distance of one half mile to the westward, namely, near the site of the old Presbyterian Church on what is now Fifth Avenue, stood the dwelling of the captain. Upon the piazza of this house, it is recorded, shaded by a luxuriant growth of ivy and clematis, the old gentleman was wont to sit in fine weather, with his dog by his side. Before the door were three rows of gladioli, which he carefully nurtured. He was a bachelor, and on the first day of June, 1801, being very ill and feeble, but of sound disposing mind and memory, made his will. Alexander Hamilton and Daniel D. Tompkins drew up the papers. In this document he directed that his just debts be paid, that an annuity of forty pounds a year be given to each of the children of his half-brother until they were fifteen years old, a sum of one thousand pounds to each of his nephews upon their twenty-first birthday, and a like sum to his nieces on their marriage. He bequeathed to his housekeeper his sleeve-buttons and forty pounds, and to another servant his shoe and knee-buckles, and twenty pounds, 
When this had been recorded, he looked up with an expression of anxiety. I am thinking, he said, how I can dispose of the remainder of my property most wisely. What do you think, General? Turning to Hamilton. How did you accumulate the fortune you possess? It was made for me by my father, and at his death became his sole heir. How did he acquire it? asked Hamilton. By honest privateering, responded Randall. Then it might appropriately be left for the benefit of unfortunate and disabled seamen, volunteered Hamilton, and thereupon it was so bequeathed. The early history of Snug Harbor is clouded with legal contests which covered a period of thirty years. Though at the time of the bequest, Randall's property was of little value, being mostly farming land, situated on the outskirts of the populated parts of the city, the heirs foresaw something of its future value. In the national and state courts, they long waged a vigorous war to test the validity of the will. Their surmises as to the future value of the property were correct, for although the income of the bequest was not more than a thousand a year at first, as the population of the city increased, the rental rose by degrees, until in the present year it has reached a sum bordering one million five hundred thousand dollars, and the rise, even yet, is continuous. However, the suits were eventually decided against the heirs, the court holding the will valid. As an institution, the harbor was incorporated in 1806, and the first building erected in 1831 and dedicated in 1833. So thirty years passed before the desire of a very plain-speaking document was carried into effect. In the beginning there were but three buildings, which are today the central ones in a main group of nine. In Toto, however, there are over sixty situated in a park. In a line, in the center of an eighteen-hundred-foot lawn, stand the five main buildings, truly substantial and artistic. The view to the right and left is superb, tall trees, shading walks, and dividing stretches of lawn, with rows of benches scattered here and there. A statue by St. Gaudens beautifies the grounds between the main building and the governor's residence, while in another direction a fountain fills to the brim a flower-lined marble basin. Everywhere about the grounds and buildings are seen nautical signs and many interesting reminders of the man who willed the refuge. The first little chapel that was built has long since been succeeded by an imposing edifice, rich in marbles and windows of stained glass. A music hall of stately dimensions, seated over a thousand people, graces a once vacant lawn. A hospital with beds for three hundred is but another addition, and still others are residences for the governor of the institution, the chaplain, physician, engineer, matron, steward, farmer, baker, and the buildings of each branch of labor required in the management of what is now a small city. In short, it has risen to the dignity of an immense institution, where a thousand old sailors are quietly anchored for the remainder of their days. Some idea of the lavishness of the architecture can be had by entering the comparatively new church, where marble and stained glass are harmoniously combined. The outer walls are pure white marble, the interior a soothing sanctuary of many colors. Underfoot is a rich brown marble from the shores of Lake Champlain. The wainscoting is of green rep and red marble. Eight immense pillars supporting the dome are in two shades of yellow Etrurian marble, delicate and unmarked. The altar is of the same shade, but exquisitely veined with a darker coloring. Both chancel and choir floors are richly mosaiced, the chancel steps being of the same delightful colouring as the piers. To the left of the chancel is the pulpit, an octagonal structure of Alps green, with bands and cornices of Etrurian and Siena marble, supported on eight columns of alternate Alps green and red Numidian, finished with a brass railing and Etrurian marble steps. The magnificent organ, with its two thousand three hundred or more pipes, is entirely worthy its charming setting. 
over all falls the rich warm tinted light from numerous memorial windows each a gem in design and colouring on one of these the worshipper is admonished to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of life among ye but only of the ship admonish as one may however the majority of the old seamen are but little moved by such graven beauty being hardened in simple unorthodox ways not a few of them are given to swearing loudly drinking frequently snoring heavily on sundays and otherwise disporting themselves in droll and unsanctified ways to many of them this institution appears to be even a wasteful affair intended more to irritate than to aid them not a few of them as you may guess resent routine duty and the very necessary officials and each other although they possess comfortable and even superior living apartments wholesome and abundant food good clothing abundant clean linen a library of eight thousand volumes newspapers periodicals time and opportunity for the pursuit of any fad or fancy and no restrictions at which a reasonable man could demur still they are not entirely happy life itself is passing and that is the great sorrow and so occasionally there is to be found in that portion of the basement room from which the light is debarred looking out from behind an iron door upon a company of blind mariners who occupy this section working and telling stories a mariner or two in jail and if you venture to inquire his mates will volunteer the information that he is neither ill nor demented but troubled with that complaint which is common to landsmen and sailors pure cussedness in some the symptom of this i am told will take the form of an unconquerable desire to go from room to room in the early morning and pull aged and irate mariners from their comfortable beds in others it has broken out as a spell of silence no word for any one old or young official or fellow resident in another drunkenness is the refuge a protracted spell resulting in dismissal with an occasional reinstatement another will fight with his roommate or his neighbor sometimes drawing a chalk line between the two halves of a double room and defying the other to cross it at peril of his life there have been many public quarrels and fights yet all things considered and age and temperament being taken into consideration they do well enough and not a few have sufficient acumen and industry to enter upon profitable employments for there are many visitors to whom useful or ornamental things can be sold and a few of these salts will even buy from or trade with each other in consequence one meets with an odd type of merchant here and there there is one old seaman for instance a relic of federal service in sixty one whose chamber is ornamented to the degree of confusion with things nautical most of which are for sale to enter upon him one must pass through a whole fleet of small craft barks brigs schooners and sloops the result of his jackknife leisure arranged upon chests of drawers still another at the time i visited the place delighted in painting marine views on shells and a third was fair at photography having acquired his skill after arriving at the harbour he photographed and sold pictures of other inmates in some local scenes many can and do weave rugs and mats others cane chairs or hammocks or fish nets still others have a turn for executing small ornaments which they produce in great numbers and sell for their own profit no one is compelled to work and the result is that nearly all desire to the perversity of human nature expresses itself there in the long light basement corridors where it is warm and cosy there are to be found hundreds of old sailors you don't need to you know all hard at work defying monotony with rapid and skilful finger movements all these are not friendly however and many are vastly argumentative no subject is too small nor any too large for their discussion in this sunlit forum especially are they inclined to belittle each other's experiences when comparing them with their own important past and so many a word is passed in wrath 
I ain't a goin' to hear sich rubbish, remarked one seaman, who had taken offence at another's detailed account of his terrible experience in some sea fight of the Civil War. Sich things ain't a happenin' to common seamen. You don't need to, you know, sarcastically replied the other. This here's a free country, I guess, except for criminals, and they ain't all locked up, as they should be. So I thought when I first seed ya, came the sneering reply, and then followed a hoarse chuckle, which was only silenced by the stamping away of an irate salt, with cheeks puffed out in rage. Nearly all are irritatingly independent, resenting the least suggestion of superiority with stubborn sarcasm or indifference. Thus one, who owned his own ship once, and had carefully refrained from whistling, in deference to the superstitious line, If you whistle aloud you'll call up a blow, if noisy you'll bring on a calm, met another strolling about the grounds, exuberantly indulging a long restrained propensity to pipe the merry lay. I'll bet you wouldn't whistle aboard my ship, he said insinuatingly. Yeah, but I ain't aboard your ship, thank ye. I'm on my own deck. And haul in the bow lines. Jenny, you're my darling, triumphantly swelled out on the evening breeze. Down on the unplaned planks of the Snug Harbor Wharf, a score of old salts, regardless of slivers, sit the lifelong day and watch the white-winged craft passing up and down, being square-riggers, that is, having served all their lives aboard ship, barks and brigs, they look with silent contempt upon the fore and aft vessels of the harbor as they sail by. Presently comes, Hello, Jim, going to launch her? From one who is contemplating with a quizzical eye, a little weazened old man, who comes clambering down the side of the dock with a miniature ship under his arm, and a broad smile of satisfaction on his face. Aye, that's it, answers the newcomer. He has spent many weeks in building the little ship, and now will be decided whether or not his skill has been wasted on a bad model. At once the critical faculty of the tars on the dock is engaged, and he of the boat becomes the subject of a brisk discussion. Sapient admonitions, along with long squirts of tobacco juice, are vouchsafed, the latter most accurately aimed at some neighboring target. Sarcasm is not wanting, the ability of the builder, as well as the merit of his craft, coming in for comment. The launching of such a craft has even engendered bitter hatreds, and not a few fights. We will say, however, that the craft is successfully launched, and with sails full spread, runs proudly before a light wind. In such a case, invariably, all the old sailors will look on with a keen squint, and a certain tremor of satisfaction, at seeing her behave so gallantly. Such being the case, the builder is at liberty to make a few sententious remarks anent the art of shipbuilding, not otherwise. And he may then retire after a time, proud in his knowledge, and his very certain triumph over those who would have scoffed had they had the slightest opportunity. I troubled to ask a number of these worthies, from time to time, whether assuming they were young again, they would choose a seafaring life. Indeed I would, my boy, one answered me one morning, and another, not I, if I were to sail four thousand times, I'd be as seasick the last trip as on the first day. Every blessed trip I made for the first five years, I nearly died of seasickness. Why did you keep it up then? I asked. Well, when I get into port everybody would ask, well, how did you like it? Are you going again? Of course I am, I would answer, and went from pure shamefacedness and not to be outdone. After a while, I didn't mind it so much, and finally kept to it cause I couldn't do anything else. One of the old basket makers at the harbor had occupied a rolling chair in the hospital and made baskets for nearly thirty years. There was still another, ninety-three years of age, who would have been there forty years the summer I was there, and withal he was a most ingenious basket-maker. 
one of the old salts kept an eating stand where appetizing lunches were served and he bore the distinction of having rounded the horn forty-nine times in a sailing vessel he was one of the few who possessed his soul in patience resting content with his lot and turning to fate a gentle and smiling face will you tell me of an adventure at sea i once asked him i could he answered but I would rather tell you of thirteen peaceful years here. I came here when I was seventy, though at sixty, when I was weathering a terrible storm around the Cape, with little hope of ever seeing the rising sun, I promised myself that if I ever reached home again, I would stay there. But I didn't know myself even then. My destiny was to remain on the sea for ten years more, with this harbour for my few remaining years. At that, if I were young, I would go to sea again, I believe. It's the only life for me. Back of all this company of a thousand or more, playing their last parts upon this little harbour stage, is an interesting mechanism, the system with which the institution is run. There is a clothing department, where the sailors get their new outfits twice a year. I warrant that the quizzical old salt who keeps it knows every rent and tear in every garment of the harbour. There is a laundry and sewing department, of which the matron has charge. There is a great kitchen, absolutely clean, where is space enough to set up a score of little kitchens. At 4 p.m. there are visible only two dignitaries in this savoury realm. At that time, one slices tomatoes, and the other puts on tea for a thousand, the number who regularly dine here. The labour of cutting great stacks of bread is done by a machine. Broiling steaks or frying fish for a thousand creates neither excitement nor hurry. The entire kitchen staff numbers thirty all told, and the thousand sailors are served with less noise and confusion than an ordinary housewife makes in cooking for a small family. There are separate buildings devoted to baking, vegetable storing, and so forth, and the steward, farmer, baker, and engineer, that important quartet, has each his private residence upon the grounds. The hospital, too, is a well-kept building, carefully arranged and bright and clean as such institutions can be made. Passing this place, I have often thought what a really interesting and unique and beautiful charity it is, the orderly and palatial buildings, the beautiful lawns and flowers, and then the thousand and one characters who after so many earthly vicissitudes have found their way here, and who, if left to their own devices, would certainly find the world outside a stormy and desperate affair. So old and so crotchety most of them are. Where would they go? Who would endure them? Wherewith would they be clothed and fed? And again, after having sailed so many seas, and seen so much, and been so independent, and done heaven only knows what, how odd to find them here, birthed into so peaceful a realm, and making out after any fashion at all. How quaint, how naive, and unbelievable almost! the blue waters of the bay before them, the smooth, even lawn in which the great buildings rest, the flowers, the calm, the order, the security. And yet I know, too, that to the hearts of all of these, as to the hearts of each and every one of us, come such terrific storms of restlessness, such lightnings of anger or temper, such torturing hours of ennui beside which the windless lifelessness of Sargasso is as activity. How fierce their resentment of that onward shift and push of life that loosens each and every bark from its moorings and sets it adrift, rudderless, upon the great uncharted sea, their eyes and their mood all too plainly show. And yet here they are, and here they will remain, until their bark is at last adrift the last stay worn to a frazzle, the last chain rusted to dust. And betimes they wait, the sirenic call of older and better days ever in their ears, those days that can never, never, never be again. Who would not be ill at ease at times? Why not crotchety, weary, contemptuous, 
however much he might choose to possess himself in serenity. There is this material snug harbour for their bodies, to be sure. But where is the peaceful haven of the heart? On what shore? By what sea? A snug harbour for the soul. End of Part 34「Part thirty five of the Colour of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sandwich Man. I would not feel myself justified mentally if at some time or other I had not paused in thought over the picture of the Sandwich Man. These shabby figures of decayed or broken manhood, how they have always appealed to me. I know what they stand for. I have felt with them. I am sure I have felt beyond them, over and over again, the misery and pathos of their state. And yet, what a bit of colour they add to the life of any city, what a foil to its prosperity, its ease, what a fillip to the imagination of those who have any. Against carriages and autos and showy bursts of enthusiastic life, if there be such, they stand out at times with a vividness which makes the antithesis of their state seem many times more important than it really is. In the face of sickness, health is wonderful. In the face of cold, warmth is immensely significant. In the face of poverty, wealth is truly grandeur and may well strut and stride. And who is so obviously, so notoriously poor as this creature of the two signs? this perambulating pack-horse of an advertisement, this hopeless, decayed creature who, if he have but life enough to walk, will do very well as an invitation to buy. He is such a biting commentary on life, in one sense, such a coarse, shabby jest in another, that we cannot help but think on him and the conditions which produce him. To send forth an anemic, hollow-eyed, gaunt-bodied man, carrying an announcement of a good dinner, for instance. Imagine. Or a cure-all, or a beauty powder, or a good suit of clothes, or a sound pair of shoes, and these with their toes or their naked bodies all but exposed to the world. An overcoatless man, advertising a warm overcoat in winter one from whom all and even the possibility of joy had fled, displaying a notice of joy in the shape of a sign for a dance-hall, a theatre, a moving picture even, the thick-witted thoughtlessness of the trade vulgarian who could permit this. But the eyes of them, the cold red and often wet hands, the torn hats with snow on them, the thin shoes that are soppy with snow or water, is it not a biting commentary on the importance of the individual, as such, that in life he may be used in such a way as this, in a single short life, as a post upon which to hang things, and that in the face of all the wealth of the world, overproduction, and that in the face of all the blather and pother anent the poor, and Christ, and mercy, and I know not what else. I once protested to an artist friend, who chanced to be sketching a line of these, carrying signs, that it was a pity from the individual's point of view, as well as from that of society itself, that such things must be. But he did not agree with me. Not at all, he replied. They are mentally and physically pointless anyhow, aren't they? They have no imagination, no strength any more, or they wouldn't be carrying signs. Don't you think that you are applying your noble emotions to their state? Why shouldn't they be used? They haven't your emotions, they haven't any emotions, as a matter of fact, or very rudimentary ones, and such as they have, they are applying to simpler, cheaper things than you do yours. Mostly they're dirty and indifferent, believe me. I could not say that I wholly disagreed with him. At the same time, I could not say that I violently agreed with him. It is true that life does queer tricks with our emotions and quantum passions at times. The ones that are so very powerful this year, where are they next? That one time we are racked and torn and flayed, and blown by emotions that at another 
find us quite dead, incapable of any response. All the nervous ambitions, as well as the circumstances by which fine emotions and moods are at one time generated, at another have been entirely dissipated. Betimes there is nothing left, save a disjointed and weary frame, or a worn-out brain or nervous system, incapable of emotions and disturbing moods. Yet, granting the truth of this, what a way to use the image of the human race, I thought, the image of our old-time selves. Why degrade the likeness of the thing we once were, and by which once we set so much store, and then expect to raise man's estimate of man? It is written, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Why take the body of man, in so shabby, so degrading a fashion? Why make a mockery of the body and mind of the human race, and then expect something superior of life? We talk of elevating the human race. Can we use ourselves as signs, and then do that? It is entirely probable, of course, that the human race cannot be elevated. Very good. But if we dream of any such thing, what must such a sight do to the imagination of the world? What conception of the beauty and sweetness of dignity of life does it not aid to destroy? What lessons of hardness and self-preservation and indifference does it not teach? Does it not glorify health and strength and prosperity at the expense of every other quality? I think so. To be strong, to be well, to be prosperous in the face of the sandwich man. Is there anywhere more of an anachronism? I sometimes think that in our general life classifications we neglect the individual, the exceptional individual, who is always sure to be everywhere, as readily at the bottom of society as at the top, as readily sandwiched between two glaring signs as anywhere else. It is quite all right to admit, for argument's sake, or our own peace of mind, that most of these men are dirty and worn and indifferent, and hence negligible. Though it always seems silly to me to assume that a man is indifferent or negligible when he will pack a sign in the cold and snow in order to preserve himself. It is so easy for those of us who are comfortable to assume that the other man does not care, does not feel. Here he comes, though, carrying a sign. Why? To be carrying it because it makes no difference to him? Because he has no emotions? I don't believe it. I could not believe it. And all the evidence I have personally taken has been to the contrary, decidedly so. I remember seeing once, in the rush of the Christmas trade in New York City a few years ago, a score of these decidedly shabby and broken brethren carrying signs for the edification, allurement, and information of the Christmas trade. They were strung out along 6th Avenue from 23rd to 14th Streets, and the messages which their billboards carried were various. I noticed that in the budding gaiety of the time, these men alone were practically hopeless, dull, and grey. The air was fairly crackling with the suggestion of interest and happiness for some. People were hurrying hither and thither, eager about their purchases. There were great van-loads of toys and fineries constantly being moved and transferred. Life seemed to say, this is the season of gifts and affection, but it obviously meant nothing to these men. I took a five-dollar bill and had it changed into half-dollars. I stopped before the first old wizened loiterer I met, his sign hanging like a cross from his gaunt shoulder, and before his unsuspecting eyes lifted the half-dollar. Who could be offering him a half-dollar? His eyes seemed indifferently to ask at first. Then a perfect eagle's gleam flashed into them, old and dull as they were, and a claw-like hand reached for it. No thanks, no acknowledgment, no polite recognition, just grim realization that money, a whole half dollar, was being given, and a physical, wholly animal determination to get it. What possibilities that half dollar seemed to hold to that indifferent, unimaginative mind at that moment, 
what it suggested apparently of possible comfort why because there was no imagination there because life meant nothing not in that case surely a whole epic of failure and desire was written in that gleam and we speak of them as emotionless i went further with my half dollars i learned what a half dollar means to a man in a sandwich sign in the cold in winter there was no case in which the eagerness the surprise the astonishment was not interesting if not pathetic they were not expecting the christmas holidays to offer them any suggestion of remembrance it did not seem real that any one should stop and give them anything yet here was i and apparently their wildest anticipations were outreached i cannot help thinking as i close of an old grey-haired irish gentleman for that he was by every mark of refinement of feature and intelligence of eye who had come so low as to be the perambulating representative of a restaurant with a double sign strapped over his shoulders his hair was thin his face pale his body obviously undernourished but he carried himself with dignity and undisturbed resignation though he must have been deeply conscious of his state i saw him for a number of days during the winter season walking up and down the west side of sixth avenue and then i saw him no more but during that time a sense of what it means to accept the slings and arrows of fortune with fortitude and equanimity burned itself deeply into my mind he was so much better than that which he was compelled to do he walked so patiently to and fro his eyes sometimes closed his lips repeating something i wondered what whether in the depths of the slough of his despond this man had not risen superior to his state his mind on those high cold verities which after all are above the pointless little existence that we lead here this existence with its petty gods and its pretty and petty vanities i hope so but i do know that a stinging sense of the slings and arrows of fortune overcame me never to be eradicated and i quote to myself that arresting forceful inquiry of one william shakespeare for who would bear the whip and scorns of time the oppressor's wrong the proud man's contumely the pangs of despised love the law's delay the insolence of office and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life not you you think boast not for after all who shall say what a day or a year or a lifetime may not bring forth and with whatley can we not all say there but for the grace of god go i a beggar an outcast of fortune a sandwich man no less to whom the meaning of life is that he shall be a foil to comfort a contrast to prosperity a commentary on health to be the antithesis of what life would prefer to be what could be more degraded than that end of part thirty five Part thirty six of the Color of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Love Affairs of Little Italy. One of the things that has always interested me about the several Italian sections of New York City is their love feuds. Every day and every hour in all these sections is being enacted those peculiarly temperamental and emotional things which we attribute more to dispositions that sensate rather than think how often have i myself been an eye-witness to some climactic conclusion to some dreadful blood feud or opposition or contention a swarthy italian stabbing a lone woman in a dark street at night a seemingly placid diner in some purely italian restaurant rising to an amazing state of rage because of a look a fancied insult some old forgotten grudge maybe renewed by the sight of another at one time when i had personal charge of the butterick publications 
I was an immediate and personal witness to stabbings and shootings that took place under my very eye, some bleeding and fleeing adversary brushing me as he ran, to fall exhausted a little farther on. And mobs of Americans, not understanding these peculiarly deep-seated and emotional feuds, and resenting always the use of the knife or the stiletto, seeking to wreak summary vengeance upon those who, beyond peradventure, are in no wise governed by our theories or our conventions, but hark by other and more devious paths, back into the Italy of the Middle Ages, and even beyond that. The warmth of passion and tenderness that lies wrapped up in these wonderful southern quarters of our colder northern clime. The peculiarly romantic and marvellously involved series of dramatic episodes, feuds or fancies, loves or hates, politics or passion, such as would do honour to a medieval love-tale the kind of episodes that have made the history of Italy as intricate as any in the world. The section that has always interested me most is the one that lies between 96th Street and 116th on the east side of Manhattan Island, and encloses all the territory that lies between 2nd Avenue and the East River. It is a wonderful section. Here, regardless of the presence of the modern tenement building and the New York policeman, you may see such a picture of Italian life and manners as only a visit to Naples and the vine-clad hills of southern Italy would otherwise afford. Vigorous and often attractive maidens, in orange and green skirts, with a wealth of black hair fluffed back from their foreheads, and yellow shawls and coral necklaces fastened about their necks dark, sombre-faced Italian men, a world of moods and passions sleeping in their shadowy eyes, decked out in Garibaldian shirts and soft slouch hats, their tight-fitting corduroy trousers drawn closely about their waists with a leather belt, quaint, cameo-like old men with earrings in their ears and hands like claws and faces seamed with the strongest and most sinister lines and yet with eyes that flash with feeling and beam with tenderness, and old women, in all forms of colour and clothing, who chatter and gesticulate, and make the pavements resound with the excitement of their everyday bargaining. This, truly, in so far as New York is concerned, is the region of the love feud and the balcony. If you will stand at any of the cross streets that lead east from Second Avenue, you will obtain a splendid panorama of the latter feature, window after window, ornamented with a red or green or orange iron balcony, and hung, in the summer time, with an array of green vines and bright flower-pots that invariably suggests the love scene of Shakespeare's famous play and the romantic love-feeling of the South. Dark, poetic-looking Italians lean against door-jams and open gateways, and survey the surrounding neighborhood with an indolent and romantic eye. Plump Italian mothers gaze comfortably out of open windows, before which they sit and sew and watch their chubby little children romp and play in the streets. Fat, soft-voiced merchants, and active, graceful, song-singing Italian street vendors ply their various vocations, the latter turning a wistful eye to every window, the former lolling contentedly in wooden chairs, the blessings of warmth, and a little trade now and again being all that they require. And from out these windows, and within these doors, hang or lounge those same maidens, over whom many a bloody feud has been waged, and for whom, for a glance of the eyes or the shrug of the shoulder, many of these moody-faced, sombre-eyed, love-brooding Romeos have whipped out their glistening steel and buried it in the heart of a hated rival. Girls have been stabbed here, been followed and shot. I have seen it myself. Petty love conversations upon a street corner or in the adjacent park between two ardent lovers have been interrupted by the sudden appearance of a love-frenzied Othello, who could see nothing for it but to end the misery of his unrequited affection by plunging his knife into the heart of his rival and into that of his fair but unresponsive sweetheart. They love and hate, and death is the solution of their difficulties, death and the silence of the grave. She will not love me, 
then she must die. The wonder of the colony is the frankness and freedom with which its members take to this solution. Actually, it would seem as if this to them were the only or normal way out of a love tangle. And if you can ever contrive an intelligent conversation with any of them, you will find it so. Lounge in their theatres, the Teatro Marionette, their cafés, about the open doorways and the street corners, and hear the frankness with which they discuss the latest difficulty. Then you will see for yourself how simple it all seems to them. Vincenzo is enamoured of his Elvina. So is Nicola. They give each other black looks, and when Elvina is seen by Vincenzo to walk openly with Nicola, he broods in silence, meditating his revenge. One night, when the moon is high and the noisy thoroughfare is pulsating with that supposed enthusiasm which is a part of youth and passion and all the fervid freshness of a warm July night, Vincenzo meets them at the street corner. He is despondent, desperate. Out comes his knife, click, and the thing is done. On the pavement lies Nicola, bleeding. Elvina may be seen running and screaming. She too is wounded, mayhap, to the death. Vincenzo runs and throws his hands dramatically over his head as he falls, mayhap shot or stabbed by himself or another. Or Elvina kneels in the open street beside her lover and cries. Or Vincenzo, white-faced and calm, surrenders himself into the hands of the rough, loud-swearing American policeman. And there you have it. But ask of the natives, and see what it is they think. They will not have it that Vincenzo should not have done so, nor Elvina, nor Nicola. Love is love, youth is youth. What would you? May not a man settle the affairs of his heart in his own way? Perdi! And these crimes, as the law considers them, so common are they, that it would be quite impossible to give more than a brief mention to any of a hundred or more that have occurred within as many as ten or fifteen years. Sometimes, as in the case of Tommaso Serali and Vincenzo Matti, it is a question of a married woman and an illegal passion. Sometimes, as in the case of Biagio Refino and Alessandro Sghea, it is some poor cigarette factory girl who, being used as a tool by one or more, has fallen into other hands, and so incensed all, and brought into being a feud. Sometimes, as in the case of Molinero and Pagnani, it is a bad, bold Carmen who is not sorry to see her lovers fight. But these stories are true legion, and in some instances the police would never have been the wiser, save for a man or a woman whom the neighbors could not get out of the way in time. Once caught, however, they come bustling into the nearest station house, these strange groups of wild, fantastic, disheveled men and women, and behind them, or before, the brawny officers of our colder clime, with their clubs and oaths and hoarse comments on the folly and the murderous indecency of it all, and all in an effort to inspire awe and a preventive fear that, somehow, can never be inspired. These damned dagos with their stilettos, these crazy wops. But the melancholy Italian does not care for these commands or our laws. They are not for him. Let the cold, chilly American threaten. He will carry his stiletto anyhow. It is reserved as a last resource in the face of injustice or cruelty, or the too great indifference of this world and of fate. One of the most interesting of these love affairs that ever came to my personal attention was that of Vincenzo Cordi, street musician and, in a way, a ne'er-do-well, who became unduly enraged because Antonio Felicitti, vegetable merchant, paid too marked attention to his sweetheart. These men, typical Italians of the quarter, knew each other, but there was no feeling until the affections of both were aroused by the charms of Maria Maresco, the pretty daughter of one of the laborers of the street. According to the best information that could be obtained at the time, Cordi had been first in the affections of the girl, but Felicitti arrived on the scene and won her away from him. Idling about the vicinity of her house in 114th Street, he had seen her and had fallen desperately in love. Then there was trouble 
for Corti soon became aware of the defection which Felicitti had caused, and told him so. "'You keep away,' was his threat. "'Go and come near her no more. If you do, I will kill you.' You can imagine the feeling which this conversation engendered. You can see the gallant Antonio, eyeing his jealous rival through the long, thin slits of his shadowy southern eyes. He keep away, ha ha! Vincenzo keep him away, ha ha! If Maria but loved him, let Vincenzo rage. When the time came, he would answer. And of course, the time came. It was of a Sunday evening in March, the first day on which the long cold winter broke, and the sun came out and made the city summer-like. Thousands in this section filled the little park, with its array of green benches to overflowing. Thousands more lounged in the streets and sunned themselves, or swarmed the cafés, where was music and red wine and lights and conversation. Still other thousands sat by open windows, or on the steps in front of open doors, and gossiped with their neighbors, a true forerunner of the glorious summer to follow. Then came the night, that glorious time of affection and good humor, when every Italian of this neighborhood is at his best. The moon was on high, a new moon, shining with all the thin delicacy of a pearl. Soft airs were blowing, clear voices singing. From every window streamed lamplight and laughter. It seemed as if all the beauty of spring had been crowded into a single hour. On this occasion, the fair Maria was lounging in front of her own doorstep when the lovesick Antonio came along. He was dressed in his best. A new red handkerchief was fastened about his neck, a soft crush hat set jauntily upon his forehead. Upon his hand was a ring, in the handkerchief a bright pin, and he was in his most cavalier mood. Together they talked, and as they observed the beauty of the night, they decided to stroll to the little park a block away. Somewhere in this thoroughfare, however, stood the jealous Vincenzo brooding. It was evident that he must have been concealed somewhere, watching, for when the two strolled toward the corner, he was seen to appear and follow. At the corner, where the evening crowd was the thickest and the merriest, summer pleasure at its height, as it were, he suddenly confronted Antonio and drew his revolver. Ha! The astonished Antonio had no time to defend himself. He drew his knife, of course, but before he could act, Vincenzo had fired a bullet into his breast, and sent him reeling on his last journey. Maria screamed. The crowd gathered. Friends of Antonio and Vincenzo drew knives and revolvers, and for a few moments it looked as if a feud were on. Then came the police, and with them the prosaic ambulance and patrol wagon, and another tragedy was recorded. Antonio was dead, and Vincenzo severely cut and bruised. And so it goes. They love desperately. They quarrel dramatically, and in the end they often fight and die, as we have seen. The brief, practical accounts of the newspapers give no least suggestion of the color, the emotion, the sorrow, the rage, in a way, the dramatic beauty that attends them, nearly all. End of Part 36 Part 37 of The Color of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Christmas in the Tenements They are infatuated with the rush and roar of a great metropolis. They are fascinated by the illusion of pleasure. Broadway, Fifth Avenue, the mansions, the lights, the beauty. A fever of living is in their blood. An unnatural hunger and thirst for excitement is burning them up. For this they labor. For this they endure a hard, unnatural existence. For this they crowd themselves in stifling, inhuman quarters, and for this they die. The joys of Christmas tide are no illusion with most of us. The strange exhibition of fancy, of which it is the name, no mockery of our dreams. Far over the wide land, the waves of expectation and sympathetic appreciation 
constantly oscillate one with the other in the human breast, and in the closing season of the year are at last given definite expression. Rings and pins, the art of the jeweller and the skill of the dressmaker, pictures, books, ornaments and knick-knacks, these with one great purpose are consecrated, and in the material lavishness of the season is seen the dreams of the world come true. There is one region, however, where, in the terrific drag of the struggle for existence, the softer phases of this halcyon mood are at first glance obscure. It is a region of tall tenements and narrow streets where, crowded into an area of a few square miles, live and labor a million and a half people. It is the old-time tenement area, leading almost unbrokenly north from Franklin Square to 14th Street. Here, during these late December evenings, the holiday atmosphere is beginning to make itself felt. It is a region of narrow streets with tall five-story, even seven-story, tenements lining either side of the way and running thick as a river with a busy and toilsome throng. The ways are always lined with carts of special Christmas goods, such as toys, candies, Christmas tree ornaments, feathers, ribbons, jewelry, purses, fruits, and a few wagons of small Christmas greens, such as holly and hemlock wreaths, crosses of fir, balsam, tamarack pine, and sprigs of mistletoe. Work has not stopped in the factories or stores, and yet these streets are literally packed with people of all ages, sizes, and nationalities, and the buying is lively. One man, who looks as though he might be a Bowery tough, rather than a denizen of this particular neighborhood, is offering little three, five, and ten-inch dolls which he announces as genuine American beauties. Here, three, five, and ten. Another, a pale, full-bearded Jew, is selling little Christmas tree ornaments of paste or glass for a penny each, and in the glare of the newly turned on electric lights, it is not difficult to perceive that they are the broken or imperfect lots of the toy manufacturers who are having them hawked about during the eleventh hour before Christmas as the best way of getting rid of them. Other dusty, grim, and raucous denizens are offering candy, mixed nuts, and other forms of special confections at ten cents a pound, a price at which those who are used to the more expensive brands may instructively ponder. Meats are selling in some of the cheaper butcher shops for ten, fifteen, twenty cents a pound picked chickens in barrels at fifteen and twenty. A whole section of Elizabeth Street is given up to the sale of stale fish at ten and fifteen cents a pound, and the crowd of Italians, Jews, and Bohemians, who are taking advantage of these modest prices, is swarming over the sidewalk and into the gutters. A four or five pound fish at fifteen cents a pound will make an excellent Christmas dinner for four, five, or six. A thin, ice-packed, and chemically preserved chicken, at fifteen or twenty cents a pound, will do as much for another family. Onions, garlic, old cast-off preserves, pickles and condiments that the wholesale houses uptown have seen grow stale and musty on their shelves, can be had here for five, ten, and fifteen cents a bottle and although the combination is unwholesome, it will be worked over as Christmas dinners for the morrow. Cheap, unsaleable, stale, adulterated, these are the words that should be stamped on every bottle, basket, and barrel that is here being scrambled over. And yet the purchasers would not be benefited any thereby. They must buy what they can afford. What they can afford is this. The street, with its mass of life, lingers in this condition until six o'clock, when the great shops and factories turn loose their horde of workers. Then into the glare of these electric-lighted streets, the army of shop-girls and boys begins to pour. Here is a spectacle interesting and provocative of thought at all seasons, but trebly so on this particular evening. It is a shabby throng at best, commonplace in garb and physical appearance, 
but rich in the qualities of youth and enthusiasm than which the world holds nothing more valuable youth in all the glory of its illusions and its ambitions youth in whom the cold insistence of life's physical limitations and the law have not as yet worked any permanent depression thousands are hurrying in every direction the street cars which ply this area are packed as only the new york street car companies can pack their patrons and that in cold old dirty and even vile cars there are girls with black hair and girls with brown some have even white teeth some shapely figures some a touch of that persuasive charm which is indicated by the flash of an eye there are poor dresses poor taste and poor manners mingled with good dresses good taste and good manners in the glow of the many lights and shadows of the evening they are hurrying away with that lightness of spirit and movement which is the evidence of a long strain of labor suddenly relaxed do you think santa claus will have enough to fill that asks an officer who is standing in the glare of a balsam and pine trimmed cigar store window to a smartly dressed political healer or detective who is looking on with him at the mass of shop girls hurrying past the shop girl had gone by with her skirt cut to an inch or two below her knee revealing a trim little calf and ankle e o i hope so isn't she the candy don't get fresh comes quickly from the hurrying figure as she disappears in the throng with a toss of her head she has enjoyed the comment well enough and the rebuke is more mischievous than angry a goldfish a goldfish only one cent cries a pushcart vendor who is one of a thousand lining the pavements to-night and at his behest another shop girl equally budding and beautiful stops to extract a penny from her small purse and carries away a thin transparent prize of golden paste for a younger brother probably others like her are being pushed and jostled the whole length of this crowded section they are being nudged and admired as well as sought and schemed for whatever affections or attachments they have will be manifesting themselves to-night, as may be seen by the little expenditures they themselves are making. A goldfish of transparent paste, or a half-pound of candy, a cheap gold-plated stick-pin, a brooch or ring, or a handkerchief, collar or necktie, bought of one of the many pushcart men, tell the story plainly enough. Sympathy, love, affection and passion are running their errant ways among this vast unspoken horde no less than among the more pretentious and well-remembered of the world and the homes to which they are hurrying the places which are dignified by that title but which here should have another name thousands upon thousands of them are turning into entryways the gloom or dirtiness of poverty of which should bar them from the steps of any human being up the dark stairways they are pouring into tier upon tier of human lives in some instances not less than seven stories high and of course without an elevator and by grimy landings they are sorted out and at last distributed each into his own cranny small dark one two and three room apartments where yet on this christmas evening one and sometimes three four and five are still at work sewing pants making flowers curling feathers or doing any of a hundred tenement tasks to help out the income supplied by the one or two who work out miserable one and two room spaces where ignorance and poverty and sickness rather than greed or immorality have made veritable pens out of what would ordinarily be bad enough many hundreds or thousands of others there are where thrift and shrewdness are making the best of very unfortunate conditions and a hundred or two where actual abundance prevails these are the homes let us enter zorg is a bohemian and has a little two-room apartment the windows of the only one which has windows looks into elizabeth street it is a dingy apartment unswept and unwhitewashed at present where on this hearty christmas eve 
himself, his wife, his wife's mother, and his little twelve-year-old son, are laboring at a fair-sized deal table, curling feathers. The latter is a simple task, once you understand it, dull, tedious, unprofitable. It consists in taking a feather in one hand, a knife in the other, and drawing the fronds quickly over the knife's edge. This gives them a very sprightly curl, and can be administered, if the worker be an expert, by a single movement of the hand. It is paid for by the dozen, as such work is usually paid for in this region, and the ability to earn much more than sixty cents a day is not within the range of human possibility. Forty cents would be a much more probable average, and this is approximately the wages which these several individuals earn. Rent uses up three of the twelve dollars weekly income. Food, dress, coal, and light six more. Three dollars, when work is steady, is the sum laid aside for all other purposes and pleasures. And this sum, if no amusements were indulged in, and no sickness or slackness of work befell, might annually grow to the tidy sum of one hundred and fifty-six dollars. But it has never done so. Illness invariably takes one part, lack of work a greater part still. In the long drag of weary labor, the pleasure-loving instincts of man cannot be wholly restrained, and so it comes about that the present Christmas season finds the funds of the family treasury low. It is in such a family as this that the merry Christmas time comes with a peculiar emphasis, and although the conditions may be discouraging, the efforts to meet it are almost always commensurate with the means. However, on this Christmas Eve, it has been deemed a duty to have some diversion, and so, although the round of weary labor may not be thus easily relaxed, the wife has been deputed to do the Christmas shopping, and has gone forth into the crowded East Side Street, from which she has returned with a meat bone, a cut from a butcher's at twelve cents a pound, green pickles, three turnips, a carrot, a half-dozen small candles, and two or three toys, which, together with a small three-foot branch of hemlock purchased earlier in the day, completes the Christmas preparation for the morrow. Arba, the youngest, although like the others, she will work until ten this Christmas Eve, is to have a pair of new shoes, Zika, the next older, a belt for her dress. Mrs. Zorg, although she may not suspect, will receive a new market basket with a lid on it. Zorg, grim, silent, weary of soul and body, is to have a new fifteen-cent tie. There will be a tree, a small sprig of a tree, upon which will hang colored glass or paste balls of red and blue and green, with threads of popcorn and sprays of flitter gold, all saved from the years before. In the light of early dawn tomorrow, the youngest of the children will dance about these, and the richness of their beauty will be enjoyed as if they had not been so presented for the seventh and eighth time. Thus it runs, mostly, throughout the entire region, on this joyous occasion, a wealth of feeling and desire expressing itself through the thinnest and most meagre material forms, about the shops and stores, where the windows are filled with cheap displays of all that is considered luxury, are hosts of other children, scarcely so satisfactorily supplied, peering earnestly into the world of make-believe and illusion, the wonder of it not yet eradicated from their unsophisticated hearts. Joy, joy, not a tithe of all that is represented by the expenditures of the wealthy but only such as may be encompassed in a paper puff ball or a tinsel fish, is here sought for and dreamed over, an earnest child-heart longing, which may never again be gratified if not now. Horses, wagons, fire engines, dolls, these are what the thousands upon thousands of children, whose faces are pressed closely against the commonplace window panes, are dreaming about and the longing that is thereby expressed is the strongest evidence of the indissoluble link which binds these weakest and most wretched elements of society to the best and most successful. End of Part 37 
Part thirty eight of The Color of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Rivers of the Nameless Dead. The body of a man was found yesterday in the North River at Twenty fifth Street. A brass check, number twenty one thousand six hundred, of the New York Registry Company, was found on the body. New York Daily Paper. There is an island surrounded by rivers, and about it the tide scurries past and deep. It is a beautiful island, long, narrow, magnificently populated, and with such a wealth of life and interest as no island in the whole world before has ever possessed. Long lines of vessels of every description knows its banks. Enormous buildings and many splendid mansions line its streets. It is filled with a vast population, millions coming and going, and is the scene of so much life and enthusiasm and ambition that its fame is, as the sound of a bell, heard afar. And the interest which this island has for the world is that it is seemingly a place of opportunity and happiness. If you were to listen to the tales of its glory carried the land over, and see the picture which it presents to the incoming eye, you would assume that it was all that it seemed. Glory for those who enter its walls seeking glory. Happiness for those who come seeking happiness. A world of comfort and satisfaction for all who take up their abode within it. An island of beauty and delight. The sad part of it is, however, that the island and its beauty are, to a certain extent, a snare. Its seeming loveliness, which promises so much to the innocent eye, is not always easy of realization. Thousands come, it is true. Thousands venture to reconnoitre its mysterious shores. From the villages and hamlets of the land is streaming a constant procession of pilgrims who feel that here is the place where their dreams are to be realized. Here is the spot where they are to be at peace that their hopes are not, in so many cases, to be realized, is the thing which gives a poignant tang to their coming. The beautiful island is not compact of happiness for all. And the exceptional tragedy of it is that the waters which surround the beautiful island are forever giving evidence of the futility of the dreams of so many. If you were to stand upon any of its shores, where the tide scurries past in its never-ending hurry, or to idle for a time upon its many docks and piers, which reach far out into the water, and give lovely views of the sky and the gulls and the boats, you might see drifting past upon the bosom of the current some member of all the ambitious throng who, in time past, set his face toward the city, and who entered only to find that there was more of sorrow than of joy. Sad, white-faced maidens, grim, bearded, time-worn men, strange, strife-worn, grief-stricken women, and saddest of all, children, soft, wan, tender children, floating in the waters which wash the shores of the island city. And such waters! How green they look, how graceful, how mysterious! From far seas they come, strange, errant, peculiar waters, prying along the shores of the magnificent island, sucking and sipping at the rocks which form its walls, whispering and gurgling about the docks and piers, and flowing, flowing, flowing. Such waters seem to be kind, and yet they are not so. They seem to be cruel, and yet they are not so. Merely indifferent these waters are, dark, strong, deep, indifferent. And, curiously, the children of men who come to seek the joys of the city realize the indifference and the impartiality of the waters. When the vast and beautiful island has been reconnoitred, when its palaces have been viewed, its streets disentangled, its joys and its difficulties discovered, then the waters, which are neither for nor against, seem inviting. Here, when the great struggle has been ended, when the years have slipped by and the hopes of youth have not been realized, when the dreams of fortune, the delights of tenderness, the bliss of love and the hopes of peace have all been abandoned, 
the weary heart may come and find surcease. Peace in the waters, rest in the depths and the silence of the hurrying tide. Surcease and an end in the chalice of the waters which wash the shores of the beautiful island. And they do come, these defeated ones, not one, nor a dozen, nor a score every year, but hundreds and hundreds. Scarcely a day passes but one, and sometimes many, go down from the light and the show and the merriment of the island to the shores of the waters where peace may be found. They stop on its banks, they reflect, perhaps on the joys which they somehow have missed. They give a last despairing glance at the wonderful scene which once seemed so joyous and full of promise, and then yield themselves, unresistingly, to the unswerving strength of the powerful current, and are borne away. Out past the docks and the piers of the wonderful city, out past its streets, its palaces, its great institutions, out past its lights, its colours, the sound of its merriment and its seeking, and then the sea has them, and they are no more. They have accomplished their journey, the island its tragedy. They have come down to the rivers of the nameless dead. They have yielded themselves as a sacrifice to the variety of life. They have proved the uncharitableness of the island of beauty. End of Part 38 End of the Color of a Great City by Theodore Dreiser Recording by Lee Smalley